Hey everybody, welcome to Pit Stops at Podium, the Rev Partners podcast, where we talk to execs who have competed and won, taking their companies from high growth to high scale. My name is Brendan Tolson. I am the co-founder and CEO of Rev Partners, and I'm delighted to have with me today, George Alifragis for this episode of Pit Stops to Podium. Welcome, George. Brendan, so nice to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. This be, should be a fun episode. Um, George brings, you know, currently George serves as a COO at Analance, a global systems integrator and data solutions provider. Um, prior to that, he's got 15 years spearheading revenue-driven organizations across technology, telecom, financial services industries. Um, so we have a lot of a lot to talk about, or a lot we could talk about. Um, but excited because for our audience, these are the type of people that we want to be hearing from. So thank you for joining the podcast. Appreciate it. So George, as we get started, I think it's be good just to level set on who Analance is. I just mentioned it at a high level, um, but it's always good for our guests to share who you work for and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have the pleasure of serving the go-to-market team at uh, Analance, and we're both, like you said, a global systems integrator and a data solutions provider. So we can build a system from the ground up, which includes applications, uh, products, you name it, we can integrate all kinds of systems. Um, so a lot of really cool technical projects, transformation projects, optimization projects, you name it. And from the data perspective, we have our own BI platform. We do embedded analytics. Um, so we, we always take a data-driven approach to everything we do. So we bring both worlds together. Love it. Yeah, I would say that's pretty uh, integral in this day and age from a data perspective. Uh, so, Definitely. George, as, before we get into our big idea, we have a tradition here at Pit Stops Podium. Uh, it's an opportunity to get to know our guests outside of work. Um, so what are three fun facts that our audience should know about you um, outside of work? Um, where do I start? So I guess first, I'm a huge foodie, so I love food. Um, and I guess I stay active and work out quite a bit so I can basically eat more food. Um, so maybe you got a two for one there. What's your, uh, what's your um, go-to cuisine? I would say sushi and Greek comes close second. I just, I like a lot of different places to be honest, but those are probably my top two at the moment. Okay. Um, second fun fact, which I guess is fun for me, sometimes a bit less fun for others, is I measure everything. Um, so I measure and track my meals, my macros, my steps, my sleep, my energy levels, my performance, my team's performance, my business performance, you name it. Do you, do you have a whoop is, is my main question. I've tried them all. And yes, I have. I think I have all of them at this point. And, I, and depending as to what I'm looking to measure more accurately, I rely on one versus, versus the other. All right. That's great. Okay. So you're foodie. You track everything. What's your third? Um, I guess that I'm a devoted dad to two French bulldogs. Um, so wait, let me rephrase that. Two crazy French bulldogs. <laughs> um, and let me tell you, I've, I've always had tremendous respect for parents, but I have even more respect now because my two Frenchies are a handful. So shout out to all the parents out there who are taking care of human beings. Um, cause it's a lot of work. Yeah. I have, uh, three little kids. Uh, I also have a dog, but, um, oh, wow. And, and yeah, so not, not much sleep is being had, here, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so let, let's George, I appreciate you sharing a little bit more about who you are, um, outside of work. It's always fun to get to know our guests. Um, let's transition to the big idea. We've talked a little bit about your background as it relates to leading teams. Um, and you've come up with a pretty interesting framework and I think it's a, a fun topic for today. And it's, and what you've kind of defined as people experiences and systems that the acronym PES as a framework really for building teams and organizations. Um, and so I, I love just to understand before we get into those three, uh, what led you to come up with this system? Yeah, so great question. Um, so one, I'm a huge fan of frameworks. I've always been and growing up in the telco space, we would always refer to people, process and technologies. And over the years, as you know, I served different teams um, and, and just grew through, through that leadership journey, it, what came together for me and you know, kind of what, where that model evolved for me anyways is, is into what I call people experiences and systems um, in that specific order as well. Um, and there's a reason behind that, but it's, it's allowed uh, my teams and I to be extremely successful. It's allowed organizations to go from 10 million to 30 million, um, from 200 million to 300 million revenue, 
um, to just grow teams tremendously at scale as well. Um, optimize teams. It's I find it's the framework that brings it all together. That's great. I think what what's exciting for our audience is, as you just mentioned, regardless of what stage you are at, mm -hmm. it could be in that kind of high growth earlier stage, that 10 million you mentioned, or it can be in a more mature uh, at scale, hundred plus million dollar um, range. So uh, exactly. that's, that's the beauty of it. It, it seems like it's uh, malleable um, and, and these are universal principles. So to your point, you kind of mentioned it in order as it relates to people, experiences and systems. Let, let, let's park on the people side uh, as we begin. Yeah, so I would say um, people are your differentiator. Uh, Oftentimes, founders, colleagues, team members, you know, they, they always ask you or they ask in groups, like, what's the secret sauce? What's the best process? What's the best technology? What should I focus on? What should I buy? My answer is sometimes the most boring one is, is, is who's behind it is like where, what's the right talent that we need for the problem we're looking to solve. It's really the people that make the difference. It's the people it's people who develop the technologies we've come to love, we've come to know. It's ML engineers who develop the AI that we see in different products, platforms. It's data scientists who solve complex data problems. It always comes back to people. And yet I find oftentimes people are often forgotten in that equation. Um, and we're always looking for a playbook. We're looking for a process. Um, even when hiring, like I've, I have, you know, the hiring market right now is crazy. Um, and I have different leaders in my network that are like, oh, I'm looking for people, but they, they don't have the right playbook. I'm like, why are you looking for a playbook? Why aren't you looking for the right talent who's going to develop the right playbook for your organization? It's not a copy and paste short sprint type solution, right? So, so, so I still find today that that comes up way too much. And, and what do you, in your mind, I don't disagree with you. I think most people would, um, but why, why do you think that is happening? Um, you know, what's the underlying reason for that? I think because it's, it's harder finding the right people. It's, it's harder finding um, the right talent that is really going to help you go from stage A to stage B. Cause it's, it's not, you're not always looking for the same profile. You're not only always looking for someone with that specific expertise in that same industry. Sometimes it's cross industry. And I think as human beings, we, 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 we sometimes tend to want to go down uh, the path of least resistance. So we're looking on Google or wherever to find a process, a playbook, a blog, something that will, will help us. But again, we can't forget that behind all that, someone wrote it, someone developed it. Um, and that, that's what really should be your focus when you're looking to grow and scale is, do I have the right people? Am I empowering my people to, to bring their superpower to work? Um, and what I mean by that is that we all have a superpower. So one, it's understanding and recognizing that, um, even the ones who think they don't really do. Um, and over the years, and this is only because of my, my team members who shared this, you know, they shared with me that one of my superpowers is unlocking other people's potential. So, so, so for me, that's also what's really important because sometimes um, we're not all born superheroes, but over time, over the years of over experience, you, you do develop superpowers. It's a question of having the right leader who's going to help untap, unlock and grow that. And that's what needs to be the focus. It's not always what's the next best tech, What's the next best practice? What is Gartner saying? I have respect for all of those, but it really comes down to your talent. And that absolutely needs to be your number one focus. Um, and the other thing I would add, because this is really top of mind, um, has always been top of mind, but especially now, is diversity as a differentiator. So when you think of people, you have to think of it through the lens of diversity, um, equity, inclusion, belonging, so DEIB. Um, cause that's where it becomes extremely impactful and extremely powerful. Um, and that's where we can, you know, dive a little bit further if you'd like, but that's, that's how I would really frame, frame it all together. Yeah. I like that. It, I, I, the thoughts come to mind as I hear you speak, you know, I, I recently interviewed, uh, Sterling Snow, who's a CRO at, at Divi, you know, just got sold for about two and a half billion. And mm -hmm. we were talking about success versus significance and, uh, people was a, a core part of it when, when we thought about significance. And one of the things that we talked a lot about was 
maximizing talent as you described just now and the reality is there's finite time <laughs> you have finite things that you can do uh, and so how do you you know prioritize what it is that you are uni not uniquely gifted at but the point is like where do you come alive and where can you add the most value um, so i really like that and i think the other thing that, that struck me is you know jim collins talks about kind of <laughs> finding the right person on the bus the, you know the right seat etc but mm -hmm. there's 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 also flexibility in that what i mean is if you're in a startup mode the characteristics or the skills that you're looking for look different than if you're in a more mature organization and so Correct. generalists for example may be what you need as you're looking to build uh, but as you get more mature it's more that specialist where you know made is a playbook um, and that's okay um, but making sure that that person is the right fit for what's necessary in that specific role um, absolutely Let's let's transition. So we talked a little bit about people, um, and let's get into your your next part of the framework that we talked about, uh, which is really around experiences. So wh what does experiences mean to you? Yeah. So to be honest, I see the world through experiences, and and I think more of us should. So what I mean by that is everything is comes down to an experience. So a process is part of an experience, right? So so you so from my perspective, the way I kind of frame it is look to develop experiences and then afterwards from there build the systems build the processes um and obviously your people will help you build those experiences and really focus in on that um and i've developed another model over the years which is basically breaking down the customer experience for both b2c and b2b across four different stages and those four stages are first buy then onboard then care and loyalty so buy onboard care and loyalty so what I would encourage um, you know, anyone to do is really to, to think of their experience and the experience they want to deliver in those four categories um, and really take the time to build a better experience, uh, an optimized one, one that's adapted across those four different stages. So what I mean by that is if I start with buy, it's all about building a better buying and selling experience. But yet still today, I find it's probably the area where people think the least about experience and 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 they don't really associate sales with customer experience when they should right because dealing with an account executive dealing with a sales lead um all of you know the very sales professions out there is very much part of your brand experience it's very much part of the experience you're going to market with and that is a huge differentiator like if i look back at some of the technologies i've gone with um, and why i've chosen you know one partner versus the other let me tell you, most of the times, if not all of them, it is the sales rep who made the difference. And it didn't, he didn't make the difference or she didn't make the difference because they were a better salesperson and more salesy. It's because they delivered a better buyer's experience. And, and again, I find that part is, is not as emphasized and prioritized. The same goes for onboarding. Onboarding, regardless if you have a product or if you have a service, you are onboarding a customer. It's that first impression post-sales. I've seen that fail tremendously where the sales experience was incredible then you get handed off to someone and it's a nightmare um and then the reason why i've kind of positioned the other two stages the way i have is once you have your customer you have to take care of them if you don't take care of them why would you think that you've earned the right to retain them um so it's all about care and yes you can take care of b2b clients this is on this is not only a concept for consumers um and last but not least is loyalty. So instead of focusing on retention, you, we should focus on driving more loyalty because with more loyalty brand advocacy, you will have less churn. You will drive better net, uh, you know, NRR and retention. So, so, so again, it's focusing on those four areas that I find has been extremely impactful in, um, in just the last couple of years. Yeah, I like the um, distinction in wording because to your point, you typically hear for this, of the three, it's people process and probably tools or technology. Mm -hmm. But from a, a, a what you're describing is there's a, there's a why behind the what. Like the, the mm -hmm. process is not like, yes, a process is useful, but what is a process designed to do? And what you're you're kind of elevating it and reminding the stakeholders that we are we are creating a process to ultimately deliver a better experience. Um, and exactly. so it 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 frames it in a way in which your prior, what are you prioritizing and why? Um, and so I think it's a, a really helpful way for, for people to think about what the process is meant to do. Um, exactly. And then it also allows you to, 
to measure those different stages accordingly, right? So instead of looking mm -hmm. at churn only at the end of your customer journey, you're actually looking at churn right from the onboarding stage, right? So it really allows you to measure the outcomes and measure the performance when you split it up in those four different stages. I like that. All right, so we talked about people, we talked about experiences. Let's now dive into systems a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, so a little bit like how I see the world through experiences, I also see the world through systems. So what I mean by that is a system is a set of things that work together as part of a framework, as part of a mechanism. Um, and, and I really apply this to everything, including the product development projects that we take on. Um, what I sometimes um, you know, advise my clients, because I'm also an advisor to, to tech startups, um, but even when, when I help my team out with different opportunities that we have, um, is don't only view it as you're developing a product, but you're developing a system. So you have to take a step back and understand how are all the dots going to connect, right? Um, and what you're really delivering is, you know, it can be a product and or a service, um, but it has to be part of a greater system. And with that system, um, you're then able to ensure the right data and analytics are embedded and integrated across your systems. And that ultimately, which is why it's part of the greater uh, framework, leads to better experiences, right? Like I'm sure there's a bunch of examples that, that, that come to mind, maybe on your end, Brendan, where, you know, there's this great product, but wow, is it either so built in silo or it's disconnected from, from this other process that you're trying to squeeze it in, or it doesn't speak at all to this other system. There's no way of having it speak to another system. It's one of the reasons really why actually, if you think about, um, you know, the last what, two, three years, integrations have just dramatically exploded. Like everyone wants to integrate with everything. And that makes sense, right? And so, so that's just a confirmation that if you build your product, your solution, um, your service within a greater ecosystem or within a greater system, um, you'll, you'll, you'll have the right holistic approach to, to then be able to deliver on the proper experience and outcomes. Yeah. It, it creates that almost like a translation layer, um, where it, it helps tell the story and, and that's kind of the, the interconnectedness and the systems exactly. allow you to truly understand what is happening and why and how you act um, to, to, to your point in terms of from experience perspective, like what, where should we be prioritizing in light of what we're seeing um, from a system? So I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, well, George has been a great opportunity for us to, to connect. I always enjoy our time together. Uh, this Likewise. has been a really helpful framework. Uh, I know that our audience will enjoy it. Um, when we think about, you know, the people experiences and systems, regardless of what stage of your company journey you're in, um, this is definitely a useful tool um, that I hope people uh, take advantage of. Um, George, any final thoughts as we, as we conclude our time together? Um, I would say, don't forget data. Uh, everyone says they want to be more data driven. I hear people saying it, I hear organizations saying it, but very few really are. Um, so again, make sure that data is part of your strategy, embedded through your strategy, embedded through your systems. Um, cause if you don't, you'll never truly be able to be data driven, right? You're just going to look at pockets of data here and there, um, without driving the insights you're looking for. So, so don't forget data. That's what I would add. Both professionally and personally, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, thanks, thanks again for coming on. Um, if our audience wants to engage with you, uh, where should they go? LinkedIn. So just shoot me a DM on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to, to continue the discussion. All right, George. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, loved your insights on this framework uh, and we'll be in touch. Thanks so much for having me, Brendan. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you later. Cheers.